Okay. So I, I suggest we start in a timely way um, because discussions appear to wind into our break uh, periods. So <clears throat> our uh, next speaker, uh, Graham Rowlands from Raytheon uh, BBN Technologies um, is going to tell us about uh, superconducting reservoirs, classical ones. Okay, uh, stage is yours. Terrific. Um, well, thank you very much um, for having me. I'm very excited to, to be at this workshop and hear about all the other exciting work uh, that's going on in this area. So yeah, today I'm going to discuss um, reservoir computing using our particular PET system, um, which in this case is superconducting circuits. Um, and this, this is work that we did internally, but uh, we're able um, luckily to partner with uh, Dan Gothier at Ohio State University. Okay, so, so just a preview of, of what's to come here. So um, we were very interested in reservoir computing um, uh, and you know, rather than just pushing our favorite platform, I, I'm probably not the first person to say this, but we think it really is well suited to the problem. Um, and that's, that's largely because uh, superconducting circuits don't have a lot of noise problems. Um, there's already a native logic scheme that you can couple to, um, and they're very fast. Uh, I'll, I'll go into more detail about this later, of course, um, but the general idea is by using circuits, which are very similar to things used um, for digital superconducting logic, uh, you can induce very interesting rich dynamics. Um, and those dynamics are a very good substrate for performing reservoir computing. Uh, and of course, you know, we have focused on tasks which are common in the literature, things like channel equalization, just as a demonstration of how the system performs. So just to kind of recap, the motivation is to create an analog physical reservoir that's capable of keeping up with very high uh, speed data streams. And as to you know, Dan's comment earlier, um, you know, we want to do this at rate, and therefore the ultimate goal is to do this using kind of this complementary digital logic scheme. Um, so a lot of this material is now moot given the uh, very nice and thorough introductions uh, that were provided earlier. So I'll try to kind of blaze through this and maybe we can leave some more time for discussion at the end. Um, so everybody of course is at this point aware of the general prescription uh, for performing computations with artificial neural networks. Um, the general idea being that you have uh, parallel input schemes uh, and no intrinsic time dependence, um, kind of accepting the, the extensions to vanilla neural networks using uh, long short-term memory, things like this. Um, feed forward inference of course in these systems is, is quite convenient and can be quite fast. Um, although you do need to, of course, keep track of all of the weights, which requires a lot of memory. Um, but the, the onerous part, of course, is the, the back propagation and the training by which uh, you find the, the errors and kind of gradually correct them with a gradient descent method, uh, typically. So for each layer, you're, you're calculating your cost function, you're finding your derivatives, and you're updating your weights. Um, you do this iteratively, you do this over many epochs, and eventually you can arrive at very good uh, solutions, although it's prone to a number of, of problems in terms of local minima, um, exploding weights, um, or you know just getting stuck in, in the in the traditional uh, spirit of, of gradient descent problems. Um, so there have of course been a lot of efforts to accelerate this. Um, most of those have largely been on the inference uh, side of things, but the the ultimate truth is that largely the hardware acceleration has just done the same thing as software, but tried to do it faster. Uh, whether that's with TPUs, GPUs, systolic arrays, even optical vector matrix multipliers, these sorts of things. Um, a lot of them are really just meant to follow the same prescription um, as the artificial neural networks, but just to do it faster in hardware. Um, and they are ultimately always going to be bottlenecked by memory access and, and routing costs of getting data around um, in, in substrates. So reservoir computing at this point needs um, very little introduction, uh, but just to emphasize you know, what, what really makes these things extremely well suited to um, being done on hardware is, is really this, this black box nature. The, the fact that you don't have to tune any of the interior weights means that the reservoir can be replaced essentially by any physical system which maps a particular input stream to a particular output stream. Um, that has to be you know, nonlinear either in the dynamics or perhaps in the readout layer, um, and it needs to obey these other properties. Um, but generally speaking, this, this can be replaced by most um, systems that perform such a mapping. Um, 
And also, as we all know at this point, uh, one of the big advantages is this relative simplicity of the training. So instead of going through multiple cycles of um, you know, forward inference, back propagation, rerunning, um, rinse and repeat uh, with reservoirs, you're only ever evolving forwards. Um, and your weight matrix is a simple um, pseudo inverse or ridge regression or, or something which scales more favorably than the back propagation in terms of the problem size. Also outlined earlier were, were kind of a lot of the, uh, the benefits to getting away from this, um, especially, and I, I don't have any plots included here, but the, the energy consumption for training kind of the, the world's largest um, deep learning networks is becoming you know, a significant fraction of a power plant um, taken over multiple weeks um, at costs of, of really uh, millions of dollars for, for cloud computing. So it, it seems like something has to, to give, especially as you know, dinner scaling has ended as we um, also heard earlier. Uh, reservoirs, on the other hand, are extremely amenable to hardware acceleration, uh, but it behooves us to solve this problem in, in, in kind of a contiguous platform uh, with integrated weight multiplication. And, and there's been very good progress towards this goal in a number of different physical systems, as we've heard from other speakers today. Um, I also do not really need to tell you all what reservoirs can do. Um, this has been, been covered uh, quite extensively. Um, so I will, I will kind of skip over that. And also, I do not think there's, there's much use in, in dwelling on you know, which physical systems. So um, as, as mentioned before, this, this can be done on a number of different systems, um, all of which can perfectly well implement the, the scheme. Um, the real question is, you know, which one provides kind of the best possibility for doing this um, at rate and efficiently? Um, and the answer may be that it's actually some combination of these systems. Uh, instead of just a single one. Um, so I, I just like to kind of skip to the, to the meat of the presentation, which is how we do this in a superconducting um, system and why we want to do this more specifically in a superconducting system. Um, so um, the reason that superconducting oscillators are, are, are a good candidate is, is summarized here. So first of all, um, they're highly nonlinear. Uh, they have a, basically a one over cosine nonlinearity, um, which is, you know, you could argue kind of as high as you can get. Um, they are extremely easy to couple. And this can be done resistively, um, although that's uncommon. They can uh, also be done inductively and capacitively quite easily. Um, the fact that there are flux quantization rules um, in superconducting loops uh, also pr provides kind of extremely easy ways of coupling large numbers of series uh, devices just with a single common inductor. So there's a lot of schemes that you can use to kind of get extremely um, large degrees of coupling in these systems. Um, and what is actually very nice is that it's easy to get both of these at the same time. And that can be difficult in, in uh, certain other systems, including optical systems. Um, so the, the other good thing is that these op operate at very high speeds. So superconducting oscillators um, can easily get speeds in excess of 100 gigahertz. Um, this is not as, as high as um, you know, optical native frequencies. Um, however, uh, what is very convenient is there is a completely compatible superconducting logic scheme. Um, many people not be, may not be aware, but uh, this was originally a competitor to CMOS um, back in kind of the early, early days of CMOS at IBM. And this, this is something that was kind of spun off into a, a separate long-lived effort, uh, which has not exactly suffered or benefited from the same uh, you know, technology scaling and commercial uh, cash injection that uh, CMOS has. But nevertheless, it, it's something that exists um, and superconducting logic provides ADCs, counters, integrators, decimators, and, and you know, various types of filters that operate in excess of 50 gigahertz. Um, and that, the ability to actually interact with your reservoir using this logic scheme is, is very tantalizing. Um, specifically, doing in situ weight multiplication should be entirely possible with these sorts of schemes. Um, and what you do with this sort of rate is really hopefully to uh, do this sort of high speed uh, processing. So to, to natively process data streams from 5G networking um, and, and other things along those lines. Um, so, you know, we, we do see superconductors as being a very competitive um, technology in terms of overall throughput. Um, and, and that's really why we're interested, just to kind of provide the, the highest level summary. Um, so this is the general scheme here. Um, which I, I will go into a little bit more detail of in just a second. Uh, but this is essentially what is known as a Josephson transmission line. It is literally meant just to move signals from one side to the other. But we abuse this uh, 
um, in such a way as, as to perform very interesting computation. Uh, but just a, a quick overview for those who might be a little bit unfamiliar with the, the physics uh, behind these systems. Um, so Joseph's injunctions, which are, are formed by uh, two superconductors bridging a weak link, um, are most typically characterized in terms of the, the phase difference of the um, superconducting wave functions in either superconductor, uh, phi, and the current and the voltage across these are given by the Josephson relations, um, which relate those, those electrical quantities to the phase difference across these junctions. Uh, and this is the source of this, this high nonlinearity is, is precisely these, these relations here. Um, now, the introduction of an external bias current um, does something interesting. It basically tilts the uh, potential um, of, of the system into a washboard. Um, and when your current exceeds what's, what's known as the critical current of the junction, um, you, you do send it briefly into a uh, voltage state, um, basically, where it will start to slide down this, this potential well in a very non-sinusoidal manner. Uh, so as, as you just exceed the critical current, um, you start to have voltage state oscillations, which look like this orange trace. Um, as you go farther and farther, uh, the frequency of these uh, gets much higher. Uh, the DC offset increases uh, and actually does eventually become more sinusoidal. Um, so so these, this kind of hints at the output quantity that we're going to be using. Essentially, we are going to drive all of our junctions into an oscillatory state and use uh, the oscillation rate or the offset um, voltage as our reservoir output quantity. So actually, when you add some resistors and some capacitive shunting, to these junctions, which is really just provided natively by the fact that you have a capacitance between these superconductors and some tunneling conductance um, here, which provides a, a, you know, a base resistance per unit area, you, you get what is essentially just a driven pendulum. And that's, that's what these equations ultimately obey. So this justice and transmission line um, that, that we're essentially going to be using as our reservoir um, is intended to, to shuttle around the basic unit of computation in the superconducting scheme, which are single flux quanta. Um, and the idea here is that if you bias uh, with a, a DC current, a junction close to its critical current, um, and then you inject a pulse, that pulse will then trigger this junction to exceed its critical current, at which point it will emit a single flux quantum, which will then propagate through the rest of the line. Um, in a cascading fashion such that this single flux quantum pulse can be transmitted from one side of the um, transmission line to the other. So this is an, uh, what's known as an active transmission line um, operating in, in the currency of these single flux quantum pulses. Um, and as it turns out, if you, if you kind of write down uh, those equations of motion for the junction in this um, geometry, you get um, what actually looks uh, a lot like a, a sine Gordon equation. So a discretized sine Gordon equation, um, which supports soliton solutions and all sorts of interesting rich nonlinear dynamics. Um, so there are actually similarities to some other reservoir implementations. The math is almost the same as the um, mechanical oscillator systems, um, which were studied by uh, Sherbrooke. Um, so it, it, it's kind of funny how that works out. Um, as it turns out, there is a ridiculous mechanical analogy to uh, the system involving um, some buckets of water, um, which is a great shout out to the reservoir community here, and um, kind of an interesting system of, of springs and, and direct torques, um, which I should note in one of these references, somebody actually went through the trouble of building, um, but that, that's something to check out if you have the time. Um, it's also fun to note that this can actually be implemented in a single long Josephson junction. So you, you do not need to do this discretization. Uh, it can really be done in just one Josephson junction with a long physical extent. And that, that's something that we've been exploring on the side. Um, okay, so how do we actually get this to operate as a reservoir? Um, we essentially turn this, this Josephson junction scheme um, or this transmission line um, into a, a, um, a wave tank. In, in a manner of speaking. Um, so instead of inputting from the left, reading out on the right, we actually terminate um, the system on either side. And we start doing an input from, from the top, from the side. Um, and we put all of these junctions into an auto oscillatory state with a bias current, which is provided to every single junction. I should note the circuit element is given by these Xs here. Um, Meanwhile, we actually input our signal in parallel, uh, but we do so in a heterogeneous manner, um, whether that is uh, by omitting some of the uh, connections to the junctions uh, 
or potentially by using different values for the input uh, resistors, it does not quite matter. Um, if you excite them all uniformly, you excite a uniform mode of the line, which is very uninteresting dynamically and can't really be used to do any sort of reservoir computing. Um, so the dynamics that are actually resulting from this are, are, are shown here um, on the bottom, and that's actually what you were seeing on the title slide. Um, it's just this from a, from a different viewpoint. Um, so for an input signal like this blue trace here, you see these very interesting rich uh, wave-like dynamics. Um, the particular inputs are only being provided at these white dots. And you can see these kind of wave-like emanations. Um, and as these signals propagate along the line, they uh, interfere very strongly um, with the dynamics of the subsequent junctions. And that's what provides the coupling between these, these various uh, nodes, so to speak. Uh, so the actual um, output quantity that we're looking at is essentially the, the just the average voltage. Um, and by average, I mean, you know, with some amount of, of filtering. Uh, low pass filtering, uh, that we're not looking at individual very fast oscillations, we're looking at the averaged oscillations as shown in these colored traces here. Um, the sample and hold times in these systems can be as short as, you know, 10 or 15 picoseconds. That depends on the choice of the junction properties and the shunt capacitances and things along those lines. So um, the question, as always, is how, how do we get this information back and how do we do something with it? And um, the ultimate goal, as I mentioned, is to do this directly using digital logic um, right on the reservoir. Um, so what that would look like is essentially um, we, we would you know, tap off the voltage at these stages, count the number of pulses, and do some sort of integer weight multiplication or floating point weight multiplication. That's, that's something that's completely possible to do um, with SFQ, single flux quantum digital logic, um, but it is quite complex. Um, and not really kind of something we're, we're ready to do at this stage. Um, so instead, what we wanted to do is just kind of get these, these low pass filtered voltages off the chip. Um, and for this, we need to do a little bit of um, digital electronics gymnastics. Uh, so essentially off of the reservoir, we pick off the signals at the particular junctions. Um, we put them through an output junction and then feed them into a digital logic chain. Uh, in this case, it includes um, what is ultimately a buffer, which prevents back action into the reservoir. Uh, not that that will necessarily kill the reservoir computing. Uh, and then we have a few other elements, um, a toggle flip-flop and an SFQ to DC converter, which is basically a latch. Um, all of these are really just used to decimate and reduce the bandwidth of the signal um, in order that we can get it out of a cryostat. Um, and that output chain is shown kind of from the bottom to the top here from the raw reservoir response um, and this is, you know, the individual um, uh, kind of dynamics of a single junction that you saw earlier um, on that full plot, including the response of, of many such junctions. Um, as these pass through the digital chain, we're decimating the data. We are doing a return to zero, um, a non-return to zero scheme. And then we are basically low pass filtering and trying to reconstruct these initial time average voltages at room temperature. And this is basically what we have been treating in simulation at this point. So we try to treat a realistic output chain, which allows us to um, capture these uh, measurements at room temperature. Um, I should note that we, we can sample, you know, as few as one or as many as, you know, five or 10 samples per period. Um, and that does have some impact on the performance. So speaking of the performance, um, you know, one of the tasks that we've looked at, it's, it's quite common here, of course, is, is the channel equalization task, um, essentially, which is to recover the original symbols uh, of a particular modulation scheme um, where a transmission was subject to nonlinear distortion, multipath interference, and additive white Gaussian noise. So um, the idea is to basically reconstruct the original data, which is scrambled um, into, into a temporal um, signal. So. Uh, the performance of the reservoir computer is, is shown on this plot here. So this is the symbol error rate as um, versus the signal to noise ratio. Um, and the, the thing which is interesting here that we, we tried to do, which we hadn't seen before, is actually plotting the performance versus the exact channel inverse function. Um, so this is this the scrambling is, per, is implemented in a way which is essentially reversible. Um, with uh, the complementary FIR transformation, a kind of inverted nonlinear transfer function. Um, of course, the noise is itself not invertible. Um, and that is precisely what sets this limit here in this, this dotted line. This is 
as well as you can perform knowing the exact channel inverse function, um, but not being able to correct for noise. And what we find is that the superconducting reservoirs perform right at this limit. Um, I should note for full disclosure that almost every reservoir we have tried performs at this limit. Uh, this is not a particularly hard problem. Um, and and that's, that's something that I think we need to be careful of in the, in the literature. Um, however, it does perform better than a typical channel equalization methods, including um, adaptive least mean squares and these sorts of things. Other things worth noting is that this can be done extremely fast. Uh, so this, this is data which can be um, chugged through at a hundred gigabit per second rate, um, which is uh, commensurate with a 50 giga sample rate given the two-bit encoding. Um, so interesting uh, point here is that uh, if we're using a single sample per period, um, we kind of saturate in terms of our performance at some level, as we're, if we're using more samples, uh, we appear to be able to continue uh, down to, to lower levels. Of course, this is a kind of prohibitively time consuming for simulations at this point, but the statistics are good enough to show and this, this banded line is one sigma in either direction. Um, that, that there is a substantial kind of deviation of these two things, which we actually suspect might be for numerical precision issues. Um, because at this point, for the k equals one, um, the weight matrix is really actually only one by 40, um, which is quite small. Uh, whereas in the case of the, um, the five samples, actually weight matrix is uh, one by 200. Uh, so we're, we're kind of curious about the numerical precision issues, which might um, kind of come into play when you're, you're essentially undersampling your, your dynamics. Okay, so as I stated before, the reservoir basically is able to implement this exact channel inverse function, um, but also that uh, basically most reservoirs can do this. So we might as well choose the one which goes um, as fast as possible or as, as efficient as possible or something along those lines. Um, but just to, to swing back and kind of contextualize this in terms of um, another commonly used metric. Um, so in this particular case, it's this, this higher order uh, parity calculation. So this is kind of a combination of a calculation and a memory capacity at the same time. Um, the idea of basically, can you calculate the product of the previous um, n bits uh, in, in a stream of bits uh, to, to calculate this nth order parity? Um, which, which forces you to both you know, perform a calculation as well as uh, remember the previous inputs. And what we find here just in this, this center plot um, basically is the, uh, the reservoir has a very similar memory capacity to um, other physical systems which have been uh, put to this task. Uh, in particular, these, um, these results from, from Sherbrooke um, which show the memory capacity um, in terms of this parity check, which I should notice distinct from the linear memory capacity mentioned earlier, um, that it's uh, comparable to those other reservoirs, which is not surprising actually, because it's basically the, the exact same math. Um, one interesting point um, that we, we discovered, and, and this is also not surprising perhaps given um, how well known it is that the reservoir time scale has to kind of match the, um, the input time scale of the data. Um, as we kind of change the physical parameters of the system, and as we change the sample and hold time uh, for the inputs, we find that there's a, a very uh, distinct peak. Um, well, distinct is maybe a, a little bit of an exaggeration. There is a uh, reasonably clear um, you know, maximum of, this, of the sum of the memory capacities, um, something around nine or 10 Josephson junctions traversed per time step. That's basically the amount of time it takes a single pulse to propagate across the system, uh, which just reinforces that, you know, no matter which parameters you're tweaking, um, you, you need to be very cognizant of, of how that impacts the, um, the, the time scale of your system and essentially how many nodes are, are coupling over that time scale. Um, so we, of course, have, we've looked at other applications. Um, and speech recognition in particular, uh, we did want to take great care here to not uh, do a lot of analog, or sorry, uh, digital pre-processing. And, and that's, that's kind of a, um, a common pitfall if you perform a full cochleogram, um, and even a linear classifier can achieve very good performance uh, in spoken digit classification. Um, so that, that's a, a problem that one has to be mindful of in addition to the other pitfalls potentially of um, you know, having different, um, just absolute you know, powers in your different spoken digit signals. So, 
Um, what we tried to do is to basically do no pre-processing at all. Um, we just directly fed the audio data into the reservoir um, as a time series with, uh, I, there was a little bit of low pass filtering, that was all. Um, and we, we found performance, which is you know, not great if you compare to um, things done by cochlear gram, uh, but we can get something like 70 or 80% performance. Uh, but what's interesting here, of course, this can be done at like 1 billion times faster than real-time speech data. Um, and if you wanna use this as kind of a, um, you know, a pre-tagging uh, algorithm, essentially um, for further analysis by more sophisticated and more accurate uh, means, that, that's something that this could be used for. Um, so yes, as, as I mentioned, you know, that we, we really wanted to avoid this kind of pre-processing uh, where even linear classifiers can give something better than 99% performance um, with, with a full cochleogram being done beforehand. Um, so kind of finally, and I, I admit I can't see the clock, so I don't know what time it is. Okay, this is pretty good. Um, so I just wanted to kind of give some discussion towards, towards what these things actually look like on a chip. So the results that I showed you were all um, simulation, but I, I'd like to point out that, that you know, simulation of superconducting circuits is, is an accurate um, thing. So we, we do not expect this to, to deviate a lot as, as we move to real systems. Um, the implementation can be a little bit difficult. Um, specifically here, I, I show what our, our laid out chips um, look like. Uh, the reservoir itself is incredibly uh, simple here. It's just this, this line of devices. Um, the reason it's so big is we've intentionally slowed the reservoir down in order to make it easier to interface to room temperature electronics. So actually these little squares are giant capacitors, which are meant to slow the time scale of the reservoir. Um, you see this hilarious um, spaghetti of, of inputs here. Um, this is meant to provide a non-uniform input scheme to avoid this heterogeneity that I mentioned earlier. Um, of course, uh, you know, if we were being smarter, we would eventually do this with some sort of um, you know, inductive, nonlinear, or sorry, non-uniform inductive input network. Um, the reason we've done it this way is in order that we can actually dynamically choose between um, inputting to some different number of nodes. So we can go from one node to uh, two, four, and eight, and, and combinations thereof, which give us up to six or 15 inputs. Um, and then we have output uh, nodes, which are only inserted at some subset. Um, in simulation, the reservoir performance is uh, actually still pretty good if you only use every fourth um, output. Um, as you go to you know, every uh, you know, one in 10 or something like that, you do start to get a degradation of performance. Um, and these implement that, that kind of digital output chain that I mentioned earlier. So this decimation and, and conversion to a non-return to zero signal. Um, so uh, another thing to note, this, this whole reservoir has something like 100 Joseph's injunctions. Um, and it's useful to kind of contrast that to other superconducting digital logic, uh, where a single multiplier can take an excess of, um, you know, 10,000 junctions for integer multiplication, uh, or, you know, up to 40 uh, for 40,000, that is, for floating point multiplication. So um, the amount of signal processing that can be obtained by the small number of junctions is, is you know, pretty phenomenal. And, and um, I mean, the, the reality is that, of, of course, you can implement these multipliers. Um, maybe you just want to use stacks of reservoirs on reservoirs to kind of try to do this all um, in situ. Um, but the reality is that you get a, a big bang for your buck, and, and also in terms of chip real estate when you're talking about this, the reservoir. Um, so we have fabricated these, these chips um, and, and gone through some preliminary measurements, but we need to go through some revision. Um, but just to kind of point out the fact that these are um, something which is relatively easily realized. Um, so just in conclusion, so we have some time for questions. So uh, we all know that reservoir computing is a, an effective paradigm for tackling a lot of different time domain problems um, and can be implemented in a lot of different physical systems in both the classical and the quantum regimes. Uh, so you know, here we discuss classical superconducting reservoirs, which give you a very fast low noise architecture for doing this sort of computing, but uh, it also happens to be fully compatible with a complete digital logic scheme, which provides a uh, very high rate signal processing capabilities in its own right. Um, and you know, as, as is evident from the other talks in this session, session there's, there's really been a lot of development here. And I, I, I do really want to consider the possibility of combining a lot of the systems. Um, for instance, you know, optical um, and superconducting intermodulation and, and, and coupling can be done in a way which is 
reasonably fast, reasonably efficient. Perhaps it's it's possible to kind of look at hybrid systems, uh, which make use of the high speeds of, of certain systems, but the nonlinearity of the superconducting systems and these sorts of things. Um, so with that, I'd love to answer any questions. Wonderful. Thanks, Akon. <laughs> Thanks a lot for the great talk, Graham, as always. Um, we have one raised hand from Dan. Yeah. So, Graham, just in listening to what you were saying at the end of, of the slide about how complicated multiplication is, um, yes. there, there are um, approximate techniques for ma matrix multiplication that are out there. There was just a recent preprint coming out of MIT last week or the week before where you can do matrix multiplication without any multiply operations. So it, it's approximate and it involves having lookup tables, um, but there may be a way to drastically reduce, you know, as long, as long as you give up on the idea that you're gonna have accurate multiplication. So in a sense, you'd have to model that approximate method and that would be just part of the reservoir computer. And, and it could be that that would, uh, completely simplify the way it's ma mainly uh, addition operations together with looking up data from a table. Yeah, that, that, that is a great point. Um, so there are definitely other methods um, that, that um, I, I, you probably remember that we've considered for this. Um, another of which is actually moving to a stochastic multiplication. Um, so when you have these extremely high rate um, junctions you you can um you you can basically uh, do a stochastic multiplication where you you have some random uh, pulse generator uh, which is biased very close to its critical current um which you are, are literally just combining in a um, an and junction uh for example with the signals coming out of the reservoir uh, and then if you just count the pulses on the outside that is effectively um doing multiplication and as, as as you actually change the balance of you know these random numbers and how they're distributed using some uh, you know bias or some um, other means of doing doing the weighting in memory uh, you can also do the multiplication the problem with that particular approach is that it's a bit slow um, because it's only accurate uh, you know over over a certain interval that's the nature of stochastic computation but um, you know doing things with lookup tables and whatnot is is enticing um, although you know uh, memories for superconducting systems are quite shallow, um, but shift registers work very well. So if, if maybe if you can think about doing something like that, that would be a, a productive scheme. But I, I think that's a great point. So thank you. Go ahead, Rodrigo. Um, hi, thank you for your uh, for a very nice talk. Um, I have a question. So lately, I think that there has been a number of reservoir computers um, working on, on bosonic systems or, or even like spintronics, um, um, even taking them to the quantum regime. Um, what specifically besides, I mean, it, this, this with superconducting qubits, you're pretty fast, but besides that, is there any hints as to what about the physics of superconducting qubits would make it good for certain tasks? Hmm. Um... I mean, I, I will go back to my earlier point about the you know combination of high nonlinearity and ease of coupling, um, which you know kind of right out of the box gives you the ability to to implement these these kind of rich soliton-like um, highly nonlinear dynamics. I, I I think that is that is useful. Um, the you know to to address the you know the the, the comment on qubits, um, yes, and you know that. A few among us have been spending a lot of time recently thinking about how you can do um, reservoir computing with with qubits, but it, it's it's a bit more delicate. Um, and in some ways, you know, this this is a very brute force method. We are literally driving these junctions into a voltage state, um, which is, you know, kind of verboten, obviously, in in the quantum information. Um, you know, let alone for for energy efficiency. And, and I do think it would be productive to consider. Um, you know, schemes of accomplishing this by still harnessing the nonlinearity, which is which is there, uh, even if you don't exceed the critical current. Um, so I, I think there's still a lot of research to kind of be done in that area. Um, 
So, so in, in the quantum systems, yes, you, you can potentially take, make use of the nonlinearity and the uh, coherence um, at, you know, at the same time without you know, expending huge amounts of energy, but it, it's a bit more tricky. Um, but as to why we think these systems are good, I, I think I can you know, claim it's, it's kind of the usual combinations of high degree of coupling and nonlinearity. I think that's the simplest explanation. Mm -hmm. So, Graham, you, you mentioned that this uh, same scheme could be done with a uh, single monolithic Joseph's long Josephson junction. Sounds like an interesting idea. I, I think, you know, early on, people looked at these kinds of systems, but would that have the kind of, how would that have a, this fan in and fan out of input and output? So you, you can literally just, you know, probably wire bond your signals to different uh, spots on top of oh, a long just junction. Randomly, just on uh, top of the, okay. Potentially, yes. Uh, I mean, you, you'd have to be a, a little bit careful about how you do this, um, but, the, but the reality of, of long doses and junctions is that um, you, you have extremely kind of complex, um, you know, solutions of, of, you know, what the fields look like, the magnetic fields and the electric fields in the junction, mm. uh, which gives you even, you know, a richer, um, you know, kind of set of dynamics um, and, and other phenomena. Um, yes, you're, you're right, though, the, the idea of, you know, actually getting the signals out is a more complex proposition as, as well. Um, so, you know, whether or not you're able to actually sample at multiple points along the line and whatnot is, is somewhat drawn into question, but um, I, I, it's, still, it's still an enticing area because, you know, then your reservoir does become this truly um, analog, you know, single, single device. Um, mm -hmm. I think in the meantime, there's a lot of advantages of doing this in the discrete sense. Um, the, you know, the largest of which is that it's very easy then to interface with digital logic. I see. Yeah. So if, are there any other quest, questions from the chat? Because if not, I want to pick your brain on energy consumption in superconducting logic. Um, any questions? Okay. So, you know, it's been said um, about uh, RFSQ type based digital um, superconducting logic that, you know, it's the energy consumption wise, there's nothing that can beat it, um, right? Is that uh, accurate? I, I think it depends on who you ask. So there, there are proponents of, you know, reversible um, computing, which really is, you know, starting to, well, does theoretically hit the fundamental limits um, of yeah. energy required to do computation. Um, however, those, those, you know any schemes which which do this are, are still relatively um, in their in their infancy um, and can implement a, a relatively minor set of operations. Mm -hmm. um, if you do compare to CMOS, um, which is a, a uphill battle, um, once again, kind of given the, the commercial development, um, mm -hmm. the the projections are that yes, even including um, the cooling costs of keeping a system at four Kelvin. Um, you can still do about two orders of magnitude better uh, than CMOS as you go to kind of um, very high scale uh, computing. We're, we're talking like, you know, the, the biggest supercomputers. I see. So I, I, I forget the, the SI prefix, but I, you know, I, I want to say this is, you know, heading towards petaflop um, mm -hmm. type of situations. Um, so there, there is a there is a distinct energy advantage in that regime, uh, for, for sure. Um, and there is there's other schemes too. There is there is AQFP adiabatic quantum flux parameterons that, that can do these things very low energy, uh, but slower. Um, there are other schemes, um, um, logic schemes, not just rapid single flux quantum. There's efficient variants of that which kind of replace all of the resistors with their ductors. Um, mm -hmm. There is RQL, reciprocal quantum logic, um, mm -hmm. which uses kind of interesting AC clocking schemes 
um, to do a lot of this. So it's a, there's a lot of different families, but the overall thought is that yes, as you go to very large scale supercomputing applications, um, there is an improvement in the energy consumption. Yes. Very interesting, yeah. So it's amazing that that improvement is with the cryogenic cost included. Um, yeah.